Welcome to Beltaloda, the officially unofficial podcast for The Expanse on Amazon Prime. I'm Jim. I'm Aaron. And today we're talking about season six, episode four, titled Readout, which I think I think is the belter word for all the information that's scrolling by on the screen. <laughs> look, look at the readout. <laughs> I have no belter accent. I thought they said they 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 read the inner's lies and they doubt them. Ah, you know, that that's as like well. uh, it's, yeah. it's their TLDR. Too long didn't read. Mm-hmm. Readout. Um, uh, what do you think what, of the episode? I I, I like the episode. Um, I think if people at this point in the season are going to say anything negative about the episode, it's going to be the fact that this is hurtling at a fairly breakneck pace. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it you could and I, I don't know, maybe they'll do something crazy in the next two episodes. But also it feels like it's easier to predict what's going to happen next. Like they have a clear because they don't have a traditional 13 or 10 episodes to work with where you can have a couple of red herrings. It's a traditional you know, uh, show threat, develop countermeasure, show it, you know, like, like we have a, like a, a threat, uh, countermeasure and then deployment, threat, countermeasure, deployment. We've seen that with the asteroid attacks and then the Azure dragon and the assault on it. And now they got the upper hand and then Marco, but you know, Marco's got protomolecule ships. Uh, so this episode, they, you know, they, they showed the threat. I predict, not having seen it, that next uh, the 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 next uh, uh, opening of the next episode is going to be about the Martian fleet that's going to go storm the gate, and they're going to get thrown back by Marco's super ships, and the rest of the inners are going to go off, oh, holy fucking shit, and you know the countermeasure will be I don't know, but like they'll probably develop it by the end of the episode, and the final episode will all about being uh you know that being deployed, so. It, it doesn't feel like there is as many like, oh, my God, I don't know what they're going to do next because it's the end of the story and they have to get there and they've got six hours to do it. So but. I'm like, I was thinking about this this morning. It's like, is that really a problem? Because, yes, they're moving fast, but like they're not sacrificing character moments. In fact, they're taking several minutes out of the episode just to listen to country music to mourn the loss of a friend. So it's like, you yeah, know, we're not yeah. getting shortchanged. It's just you know, kind of end of series, uh, itis mm-hmm. where it's like, everything has just been set up to knock down and that's it. What, what, what are you thinking about these, these first four? Uh, I think that's all mildly interesting. I, I know, uh, <laughs> you know how this, this book ends and how I think the, the series will end at the end of this book. Um, so, what do you think about the the burn rate of the material? I guess that's what we've talked in other where you've like, in some seasons you're like, I can't fucking believe yeah. we're 75% of the book. It's only episode three. Uh, I mean, I'm starting to feel it, it, the, the reality is sinking in that we only have two episodes of this show. Right. Left, period. Um, yeah. Not, not of this season. Not, not of like, oh, we're at the halfway point. No, man, we're two thirds of the way through the end of this show. So well, we might get more, but that's all, you know. Yeah. And there's still Santa, a lot to Santa do. Santa speculation I, at this point. <laughs> I think that it is certainly all doable in the next two episodes. It They might. They might have to lose a couple of those character beats, although I think there's still at least one more to play out um, with Philip. I, I think like we've seen a lot of, uh, as you said before the podcast when we were talking, two steps forward, one step back sort of stuff um, with him. And I, I think that's that feels real, that feels natural and, and rewarding, but we we haven't seen the totality of that yet, I think. You know, he mm-hmm. keeps like, we talked also about this this readout title, like what could that mean? And I almost felt like there was an emotional readout from Philip this episode where he is fortifying his position as Marco's son, right? As a as a belter, as you know, every every time he he has these moments of I think like humanity where he starts to go, oh God, I've done a terrible thing and I should be ashamed of it, then something happens to to get him indignant again and Mm -hmm. and then he goes on these tears of being like a true belta you know Mm -hmm. and and i think that hasn't totally played out so i'm excited to see how that goes in the final two episodes just to be clear because maybe people don't know a readout is uh like a military fortification but it's always like a temporary or like the idea of it's like been hastily constructed uh (laughs) to to retreat Uh to a place of defense to like Think like yeah. a wooden stockade, you know, like a, 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 a 
uh, a square thing with like like wooden fences and or maybe it's just the earthen works kind of thing but it, the the, mm-hmm. the essential thing is it's a temporary place of refuge to kind of regroup and 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 attack from and i'm looking and i'm like is it series station is it like you know is it marco's spin supply depot uh are they going really metaphoric and it's actually like the redoubt is in all our hearts like you know that the, the monica <laughs> sure. is trying to build a hastily constructed redoubt that we can all emotionally retreat to to then uh you know counterattack marco with like I, and and I, I like your suggestion too that this is like uh, you know another metaphor internal to to Marco like he's and I'm sorry Marco Philip he's trying to build up some of his, of his internal defenses and yeah and I think what they're doing with Marco is is some of the most interesting stuff to do it on the show because like to me it's very this feels very realistic that you grow up idolizing and being brainwashed by one parent and then you meet the other and you find out that they're not at all what your other parent said they were. Mm-hmm. And you also have the, yeah. the, the the issue of like your parent, you know, not living up their their uh, their ideals, um, but they continue to lie, manipulate. And and you see the stuff breaking down in real time and the way they're doing it. They're not like I, I could see a lot of people saying like, ah, I don't understand why they're giving Philip and this fucking new guy some some rando red shirt, like all this quality screen time. But like because all this precious screen time, but like. This is the whole game, man. This is Philip figuring out in real time. Oh, my dad said that series are a bunch of well wallas that are fat and and lazy uh, because they just want to serve the inners. And he sees this guy's brother who has a condition, can't go in space, would love to. And also, if he was a regular belter and if he was gung ho and charging into the free Navy, this guy would have died because no one would be there to look forward to like all these kind of like. Mm -hmm. Little tiny lies he sees, little tiny tiny cracks, and sometimes large cracks in his father's facade. Um, he he can like you know start to to see something, but then you know uh, Rosencrantz, Rosenfeld, yeah. Rosenberg, Feld. Uh, <laughs> Rosenfeld comes and and puffs up his head with like you know the only thing that's keeping your dad you know uh, puffed up and stay, and then he's turning into like a little Marco at the end. Mm-hmm. I think that's just it, like you said, it, it feels really good. You're not going to I mean, I, I don't know what some people are out there thinking that like um, you go to a teenager and you tell them their parent that's filled them with their heads full of lies. Uh, you just give them proven factually wrong once and they're going to be like, oh, shit. Yeah, of, totally. I'm going to turn. That's not how this stuff works. It's like you said, two yeah, steps yeah. forward, one step back, two steps back, one step forward slowly recovering from the mental abuse you've been under um mm-hmm. and i and if anything this is still taking place far far too quickly but they are <laughs> taking their time yeah. in a six episode season to to continue the fine arc they had from season five and that's a good thing right they've had two seasons now to do this so it's it's not oh shit we gotta rush and do this stuff all in six episodes as well as everything else from book six it's they've had time to build it and so it, it feels more natural um yeah, I, I really liked what they're doing there. And then how did you feel? I guess like my biggest question from the previous episode was, how are they going to handle the Holden Naomi dynamic after Holden essentially threw away their shot at just killing the head of the free Navy um, to preserve her son's life? How did you feel they did with, with that? I, well, I thought they did fine. I I hate it. I think it's Holden is full of shit and he shouldn't have done it. And Naomi said all the things that I thought she should say about it. Um, I will say that when we get to that scene, I want to talk about like where I thought that scene was going and then kind of being disappointed that it didn't turn out that way. Mm -hmm. Um, But but yeah, it's one of those things where it's like I'm like I'm Amos. Yo, Cap, I've been turning this around all week since I've seen the episode. And yeah. I want to see I want to see the, the angle and I'm not seeing it because the angle is a purely selfish one. I can't. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a human one, though. Right. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. I can't be the one that kills your son because I know that you'll never be able to look at me again the same way. Putting a Naomi above the safety of the solar system of all humankind. Right. Uh huh. That's pretty shitty. But like, that's the thing that people do. And it wouldn't surprise me because there's also like a little lost in translation. Like Philip is piecing together what happened from his side and i think he's drawing different conclusions and that might turn the fate of the whole fucking war Mm -hmm. but this is very lord of the rings like who you know like uh bilbo 
uh, and Frodo spared this weird, pale, twisted hobbit dude that ends up kind of sort of saving them all in the end. Uh-huh. Uh, two very human acts kind of, or I guess hobbit acts, canceling each other out. So they might be going with that, but like I just can't as a, <laughs> as kind of a, a what what do you like like a, a pragmatist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just can't co-sign. Well, yeah, you, yeah, I can. I mean, I can understand what he did, but Jesus, it's yeah. frustrating. Yeah, no, 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 same here. Like, I, I get why he did it, and and I think if Holden were to try and justify it to Amos, there'd be some long string of like what you said, some butterfly effect of kindness and love and and peace that that he would try and spin toward like showing love toward a single person is actually what everyone needs to do. And we just need to get, if everyone were on the same page about this, we could make it happen. But like, you're not, you're in a war, right? Like mm-hmm. that ship has kind of sailed in the, for this particular situation in this moment, you got to do, you got to make the tough decisions and you got to make the sacrifice. And I think, yeah. you know, one of the things that, that Duarte says to, um, Kara, Kara, Mm-hmm. Um, in the beginning kind of carries through to what Holden's doing. He's not willing to make that sacrifice, giving up, you know, potentially his own relationship with Naomi in order to win this war and then take down the enemy. So, yeah, I, I think that the thing is, is I think aim Holden could have leveled with aim le- leveled. He could have leveled mm-hmm. with Amos and Amos would understand. But I think at the end he'd be like, well, don't do that again or I'm out. Mm-hmm. because like i am trying hasn't to hasn't he already war. said that to holden hasn't he been like you're the guy i look to for my moral compass i mean he did and- say that but i'm saying like that's in absence of holden explaining because like I, I, I holden had an explanation like that scene is uh-huh. a little bit dishonest because he had an explanation the explanation was just purely self-serving and didn't take into consideration literally anyone else's feelings not even naomi's yeah uh so the year, I bet, but you're right. Like Amos all but told him like, you do this one more time and I don't even know why I'm out here fighting. I might as well just go back to find the most comfortable spot in the system. That's going to have the lights on the longest and go to the best brothel and spend all my Rossinanti shares on it because fuck, fuck this being out in the void, getting shot at kind of shit. Yeah. I thought he had done that before in the series. Maybe I'm thinking of this moment in the book and remembering mm. that as a, a previous time that, uh, Amos had said, "Hey, I, I'm you're my moral compass, and if you fuck up, I fuck up. So don't fuck up, or I'm leaving." Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, uh, before we go further, I just want to like catch you on something. I think you called the admiral on Laconia Duarte. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that? I thought that's the guy who died in the gate last year. This, I think, this is a new supreme commander. <sighs> it of Laconia. might be. I, I, th- the book is Duarte. He's doing all of this Laconia shit. So, or maybe I'm. I'm also. Uh, maybe I'm. Re- I'm forgetting thought, who Alex's uh, old uh, commander was from last uh, season. So it could be uh, my. No, I, just, I think I just, you're I right. Had no idea what this guy's name was, and I wasn't sure. I thought sure. it said Duarte on his uniform, but maybe not. Maybe not. Oh, I thought it said. Oh, because I'm looking at my notes, and I re- I thought I wrote it Quarte, like with a Q. Oh, Duarte so I, I guess and Admiral Quarte <laughs> were taking place of Admiral Duarte. <laughs> so you might be right. You might be right. That might have been a false correction. I don't know. I, I, I don't haven't know, read the I book, so I don't, you were right I don't too. know. So. It all gets very fuzzy. Um, mm. Okay. What do you say we get into the episode? Yeah. Um, before we do, I just want to say, like, you know, there's like one, uh, just a few more days left in the so-called holiday season before we move on to New York years. And if you haven't given our uh, Very Belt of Christmas a shot yet, it should be in the podcast feed you're listening to or should be on this YouTube channel. You're watching a video uh, and a lot of people have liked it. And uh, I just just just, uh, just want to make sure you get a last chance to get some holiday cheer. Uh, not even cheer. It's just a holiday full spectrum emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, as as seen through Christmas in the belt in the 24th century. Uh, very belt or Christmas, check it out. All right, we're back with the continuing adventures of Kara the Explorer. <laughs> Special guest star, mm-hmm. the Admiral with a seeming host of crippling psychological issues. Jim, what'd you think of this fucked up funeral scene? Uh, I, I was just waiting. I was, ta- I was looking at my watch going, man, when does the pet cemetery close? Because I know... <laughs> <laughs> after I like once it gets dark they shut the gates on that shit so you need to get out there with that body mm-hmm. kid because uh, mm-hmm. we all knew what was happening right I, I don't think oh, there yeah. was any question that we had a pet cemetery situation on our hand after last episode here we get to see the next step and next episode we'll get to see 
uh-huh. uh, whether or not it works, whether or not it fucks him up and turns him into some crazy hybrid thing. Gives uh, him a permanent dick sucker mouth, you know, sure. like that uh, seems to be the body plan. <laughs> I don't of these. know if you could say that about children, but it, uh, I, I, I do. Hey, love... I'm not I'm not a purple frog. They are the the perverts here. They're the ones transforming <laughs> pe- things into sex dolls. It's like a very unfortunate mm-hmm. thing. Um, and uh, I don't condone it. But, I'll say something uh, taboo about frogs children. Have their own agenda. Uh, I'll bring a taboo child statement into the mix. Uh-oh. I love Uh-oh. seeing children doing taboo things like escorting their brother's dead body to the pet cemetery. I think there's something fucked up and unnatural and just wrong about that whole situation, and I love it. Mm. It is like uh, a little bit Stephen King, like uh, oh, a lie, yeah. ch- children f- uh, fucking around with stuff that they shouldn't, and they're going to find out. Um, I did, I did get a little bit of like, uh, the Grimes family dynamic from the walking dead. Like who is watching these children? (laughs) Like you guys live in a hab that looks like it's 30 feet round. I'd say square, but round. And she's taking like a six wheel medical bed out the front door. And the Uh parents are just, you know, you just try, you like, (laughs) if my my child had died in the last 48 to 72 hours, I'd be on high alert for everything. Like, I can't believe, yeah. I can't believe this is, this is, yeah, this is, this is Carl running off, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for dramatic purpose, uh, all mm-hmm. over again. So I just, not, not a fatal error, but, uh, anytime you're straight, straight, straying close to Grimes storytelling and walking dead, eh, maybe pull it back a notch. I, I mean, she's but, been uh, that the entire sixth season though, right? Like, I mean, she started this whole thing by being out on her own playing with true alien plant and animal life maybe she gasses her parents like she's she's very resourceful (laughs) she takes things without permission she goes to the medical thing she gets a high grade narcotic and she just you know aerosols Mm -hmm. it and that's how she gets that's how she gets her unsupervised time um that's how i would do it they do before we talk to because i want to talk about the admiral a bit i also admire um all jokes aside the storytelling of this show has always been tight Mm -hmm. like Kara dashing out in front of the vehicle and almost getting ran over pays off because there's like, I don't know, because I cranked up my sound system, don't have subtitles, but Mm -hmm. I want to hear what all the walla walla murmur murmur was going on. And they're talking about like, yeah, apparently this uh, this kid ran out on a curve of the road and the vehicle flipped over on him. Uh, The driver's being held personally responsible, even though it's an accident. There's people saying, uh... You know, like, and he's like, well, what do you think is going to happen to the driver? And they're like, well, what do you think? And he's like, well, it's just an accident. And it's like, you think that matters? There's soldiers talking about forming a firing squad. Just in case you haven't gotten the note on Laconia, it's a very martial, hard nose, you know, uh, can't wear a bracelet commemorating your mother's death kind of society. Mm-hmm. And it hasn't chilled out since season five. Um, I since thought that they was good. Changed to Admiral Coarte. Uh, Admiral Coarte, he's just as hard nosed as Duarte, <laughs> as Duarte was. was. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the admiral? Because he seemed like a whole ba- box of crazy. I, I liked him. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's got his issues, but I feel like he's trying to, you know, give give this girl a, a much needed emotional uh, support moment. So, but it was also about. I felt like it's as much about getting support for himself yeah. as her, like, you know, like her putting his yeah, hand, like her I'm hand doing his a tough thing being like, and, well, what if I fail? You know, yeah, it's... don't give up, Admiral. We need you to protect us. Like, <laughs> yeah. But also, she's not taking his advice. He's like talking about sacrifice. Like, you got to make sacrifice. And she's like, nah, I don't I don't want to. Sorry, not going to happen. And, and what? so he's clearly talking about Mars as both a yeah. place and a concept and like a sense of nationality. Mm hmm. What does it look like sacrificing Mars, especially when he he's like, ah, you know, we're not just talking colloquially. I'm talking about to make sacred, like to burn up as an offering. I'm wondering if, you know, like because because Mars, like they got their parliament building exploded, but they've gotten off relatively light compared to Earth. I wonder if there's, a, a, you know, some some new punch is going to come as a reprisal for their uh, maybe hasty attack that they're playing in this episode. Could be. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what he was getting at. Um, I don't either. I don't know why. Yeah. Like it may, cause like I said, you might be right that they're just trying to sell us on this guy being super hyper vigilant and trying to protect everybody and, you know, has some trauma from, from all the experience of seeing Mars fall apart, but he read his religious nut job to me. Yeah. It might be a Naomi thing. Um, like kind of what Naomi's on about like 
killing her belter friends is is a very mm. hard thing to do right that might be a sacrifice like all the martians do you think it who ties have had in... to die or will have to die do you think it ties into Kara, her brother at all like you know cuz he's making some kind of allusion to his sacrifice of her you know making it mean something to her brother's death and making that mean something maybe maybe he doesn't seem like as concerned about the death of this child as he is about the larger situation that he's in. So I'm not sure if he's aware enough to do that, but maybe they, they also might be telling a story of a burgeoning rebellion because it's clear to me that Kara's parents don't want to be here. They were sent as an advanced scientific scouting team. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to be back on earth presenting their uh, research materials, but the gate being interdicted has stopped all of that. So there's a lot well, of people and, and there's a, there's a lot of people that feel like these also <laughs> like, let's not forget that they, this faction betrayed Mars and yeah. earth every inner and went off and did its own thing to help the free Navy. So like, well, if you look at it correctly, though, Jim, you'll see that the Martians, the, the Martians still on Mars are the actual traitors betraying the Martian ideal. And this is the true blue Martian <laughs> well, stock that has split off the decayed carcass of sure. their society. Yeah, that's I mean, how like, Coarte would spin it. But what does Paris think? What is Paris <laughs> going to think when when, you know, Kara's parents land and say we're here for our internships? I don't well, Paris won't say shit because they took a 40 kiloton asteroid right up the Eiffel Tower. I, that's, oh, no, did I don't they? know. That's I don't true. No, I, that's I'm oh, just no. making that up. But uh, yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, it's it's they're, they're, they're definitely setting this that like there's been some low grade hostility between like the more research oriented people um, and the Laconians who have kind of come and taken over. Um, and it could be that they weren't told that, you know, they were defecting and all this. They were just. Oh, I don't think so. Right? I, th like, I, I think, yeah, that was very much a surprise when it's like, surprise, we're taking over yeah. and the ring gate shutting and maybe not open ever again. And I wonder also, how much news they get there. Um, do they know about the war going on? Do they, they know about all that the Marco ship? has completely can uh, shut down communications through the gate? So like Marco okay, might so be don't. getting messages, but he is not relaying them to anyone else. Um, so it's it's been zero communication to any of the settlements throughout the, the, the ring system at this point. Gotcha. Hmm. Um, no, it's, it's interesting to see. Cause I'm like, I'm also trying to think of like, like what, what would a rebellion even look like? I feel like it'd be swiftly and surely put down, put down by the, the Spartan warriors here. Um, also I mentioned that last episode that there was like a ring gate structure surrounding the proto molecule cruiser that they're constructing. I, I got a better look at it, and then now it looks like that's a, like a helix. There's like a helix of ring gate material that's coiling around the entire assembly. Uh, and I wonder what, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm looking for function in this form because yeah. it looks like a potato with a ribbon around it at this point. But is that just like the, the shipyard docks? Is that, is that like the, the yeah. gantries they use to build this thing or what? I don't know what would the proto molecule because it's all spider webby and organic look like. What's yeah. you know what's the proto molecule have to new to the it? star dock? Yeah, or do they so grow I saw it, <laughs> right? Yeah, and also like because that was something I got that I didn't really appreciate on my first watch through of the series. Oh, first few watch throughs. Um, is the arborgast? The proto molecule was kind of like thrashing around looking for something to do until it dismantled the arbor gas and then a few episodes later launched a vehicle very much in the arbor gas like it's a big saucers kind of like i think it literally yeah. learned how to make a starship from them feeding it the arbor gas uh hmm. and i wonder like it makes me wonder what they put in as an input for these proto molecule kind of hybrid ships and what they yeah. put in as the or, or maybe this is just a custom creation from recordazar uh, let's talk about his thing. He comes running in mm -hmm. screaming um, at the end here. Uh, what's he going on about, Jim? Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but as far as what he says, something about coordination protocol returning a coherent reply pattern. See, this to me is bad news because they have hinted for the last two seasons that there is a larger threat that killed off the proto molecule makers and they're all dead for like a bill, what a billion years. So any response we're getting at this point, probably not from them, 
uh probably mm-hmm. if i'm guessing we'll get you know a few episodes left probably from the the red fire demon gate things yeah. like it's bad news sounds like it's bad news like, pro uh, anything that Co- cortisar's doing is probably <laughs> bad news i i don't see him <laughs> as like definition. a benevolent entity yeah uh no no he's probably fucking something up yeah anybody 3d printing an alien battle cruiser probably mm-hmm. you can't you can't trust sure uh, all right, I think that takes care of our Laconian business. Uh, let's move back to our system on Ceres Station, where the station manager uh, that Marco abandoned is whipping her people into an anti-inner frenzy. And let me tell you, the inners, not fans, not fans of this rhetoric, Jim. No, no, I mean, they probably shouldn't be. Um, we, we find out what the stuff that was vented last time was. It was water. It was water. Oh, we were thought, wondering, yeah. like, what what was up with that? Okay, it's water. So, does that? I, I assume that reduces the three weeks of time that they have uh, to get support so. to the series station. All these people are dead, right? If all their water tanks are vented, they're dead. They're dead. I don't know if it's all, but yeah, yeah, and, it might not be all of them. And I'm like, at what point does she turn on Marco? Because like the people are all like pissed off at the inners now, but like they got eyes. They saw the sequence of events. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe they don't believe what the inners are saying as far as their intelligence and and their uh, tracking down of Belter munition resource and uh, serial numbers and stuff like that. But like, there's no food, no water, and you got an administrator saying we got you know we're, we'll be fine if these people leave. They leave. There's still no food or water. Like, is this turned into a death call? I don't. The station manager. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know. She's trying to maintain control and calm because if she loses that, then the blood, the, the, the death toll rises. But it feels like the death toll is going to be close to 100 percent anyway. I'm not sure what At her game point, is. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. I don't I don't know exactly what the point of of calming people is, but maybe Although it's just guess, something to do. It's the only and, thing and she, she can do. So she, she's also building rapport with it. Like, you know, she's not turning on. She's still maintaining her cred as a true belter. And maybe that's going to give her a position to pivot towards accepting help from the belt or from the inners because, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like an only Nixon can go to China moment. Sure. Uh, like a Fred Johnson uh, bridge there. Yeah. You know? She's trying to be cool in, in both of the uh, the inner and the belters eyes. I, I don't know. It's 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 wild. But I, I do like how. This show is again building like, you know, when the administrator said or when when Avastral is pondering about leaking the information they have about the Belter explosives, she's like, it's just be going to be one more lie and along. And the show, to its credit, has shown us those lies like Anderson Station mm-hmm. was a bullshit operation to just cow uh, a bunch of Belters and killed a bunch of men, women and children, uh, innocent and uh, unarmed. Um, yeah. You know, Eros. like <laughs> what Eros, was it? I mean, that wasn't. Like- official inners but it was inners come on but it was inners it was inners yeah. fucking with them using them as animals um and they probably still haven't got the full truth about that uh there's and like you know the the mars and earth pointing fingers at each other over the cons and over like mm-hmm. there's just all this mutual distrust and it, it got at something real that like you know lying is such a top tier strategy in dealing mm-hmm. with any any group of people uh, right up until they stop believing you. Yeah. And then it becomes the worst because you can't tell them anything anymore. And this just goes to show it's True. like maybe some hard truths and some uh, uh, sharing and caring a hundred years ago, we wouldn't be in this situation. But, mm-hmm. you know, like like Holden says, you're always trying to murder your way out. Uh, you're trying to kill your <laughs> yeah. way towards a better future. And um, a lot of expediency. So I, I, just, I just like that. It felt real. It felt like a, a politician being like, shit, we can't do this because it's it's stupid. It won't work. We got to think of something else. Uh, uh, the, the other details we get in this scene, uh, that explosion took out the two new Martian frigates, which I think were those those uh, shit. What is what is the class? They weren't Donager because those wouldn't be called a frigate. Yeah, those but, weren't frigates. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, so took I, out a couple I, other ships too, they, and they, they were already them, weak. I think Marco is Marco's got a Donager class, or is he using it? Because I thought they always referred to it as a heavy frigate. So I, like, I want to say the Donager class was the, the one that disintegrated with Duarte. If really, if in fact he disintegrated, I'm not sure. He would have had like their flagship, and those are. Those are the big ships that Mars yeah. has, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Donagers. it's the the, the the biggest the biggest class that they particular have. But so mm-hmm. 
the, the idea is like, you know, these two probably could have equaled uh, Marco's flagship and they just lost it in this, you know, uh, Belter um, terrorist attack. Yeah. So, and they, they're making a point about how they don't have the military required to get out there and take back like Medina Station, for instance. Um, and military is also a terrible way to distribute humanitarian relief. They're not, you know, they like they're oh, not yeah. great at keeping a peace or um, things which, of that nature. Which I mean, knowing that they're already kind of like stretched thin um, with everything they have to do, it makes it extra insane when the MCRN admirals are considering going this alone with an attack yeah. on Medina Station. It's like. You, the combined fleet, the joint fleet here doesn't have what it needs. You think you're going to do it with what? Well, a they got third of the joint ships fleet? And they got, I they mean, got the, yeah. I, the, I, Mars is weaker than Earth's fleet at this point, right? Because Duarte stole half the shit. So, and they were, they were decommissioning a bunch too. Right. Like it's, yeah. No, it I, seems insane. Not, not just foolhardy, but like the people pondering this idea are just totally out of their mind to me. Yeah. But, um, I don't know if you think that uh, sitting here and playing, you know, humanitarian relief aid to the Belters, why Marco entrenches a position that they already sent, spent a lot of time last season convincing us is like, man, once you get in yeah. there, you've got a real stranglehold on the ring gate. Uh, like it, yeah. it, it might make a certain kind of sense because if not now, when we get weaker every day, we do have a stealth ship advantage. We can get an element of surprise. We can't. I, I think it's stupid too. And it, it uh this this captain I admired so much, I don't like her as a warhawk. But uh <laughs> Yeah. Um Yeah, I I, I I don't know. I'm I'm curious to see uh what uh, be befalls the the Martian. Because like I said, I I think it's an easy prediction to make that you're gonna see a bunch of badass Martian ships going out to the ring, stealth ships are gonna take out a couple of the sentries and stuff, and then right as they're it looks like the tide they're winning, then you're gonna have these proto molecule cruisers coming out and fucking slice them up. But yeah, I'm I'm curious to see what the proto molecule comes up with in terms of an actual weapon of war, mm -hmm. because what we've seen so far from the proto molecule is essentially the equivalent of like a nano machine bulldozer making an interstate highway. Uh -huh. <laughs> like Except these were intentionally for... lethal machines, you know. These were just yeah civic works, like a it's like a bridge coming to life and <laughs> attacking true. you, you know. So like, what yeah. is a warship gonna look like? True. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Their, their weapons could be far beyond our capacity to, to imagine. Um, yeah, but who knows? Uh, moving on to Monica doing a sympathy piece, uh, regarding some slain UN troopers when she runs into some access problems. Yeah. Yeah. My big question coming out of the scene is why would Belters care? I don't know. The, the Belters, you know, run the gamut, right? They, they're on there's there's a spectrum of belters out there as far as how sympathetic they are to humanity as a whole um and how factionalized they are maybe some of them will care maybe that's what they're trying to do here with showing earthers uh stories who who are killed in this thing killed by belters trying mm -hmm. to help belters i i think that like it's a percentage game. Like anytime you humanize someone, I think about like going back into my experience with the Cold War, like, you know, how like American got hyped on like things like our hockey team beating the Russian hockey team. Sure. And how like what a high we got on nationally when that happened. And I'm like, I, I don't remember, but I guarantee that NBC, whoever had the Olympics at the time in 1980, was not doing puff pieces on the Russian players. And like, you know, mm -hmm. look at Sergei. He grew up a poor farmer from the Ukraine and all he wanted to do is play hockey. And his grandpa taught him on their frozen lake. And he's like, like, it'd probably be harder to just be like, you know what? Fuck those Russians. Yeah. Amer if they did that kind of like and that, you know, it's just it's a small thing like that, like humanizing people. These aren't faceless. These are people who had hopes and dreams just like you. Maybe a little, maybe a little tone deaf talking about them swimming in a sea uh, yeah, <laughs> for yeah. pleasure uh -huh. uh, and sport. Like sure. maybe, maybe, maybe all not the extra play water up. we have. Yeah. 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 We just, we just sure. fucking, yeah, it's all, you can't drink it. We just fucking swim in it. Fuck right. it. You know? Uh, I, but, but yeah, I think, I think that it's sound, you know, like uh, uh, making them appear weak because that's the first mm -hmm. thing, you know, we are not a killing machine. We can be killed and we're, we can be killed even when we're trying to help. And, I, I think it's I think it's I would be surprised if it doesn't work to some extent, especially since this is a show that seems to be wanting to push that that perspective. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, the Rossi is continuing now that it finished its little skirmish last episode on its way to rejoin the fleet at Ceres. The crew is licking their wounds from the battle damage that they incurred in the last episode. Uh, when Peaches noticed something odd in the dead torpedoes flight tele- telemetry. Oh, this is the scene I have no real notes for, uh, cause it's gonna, it's just a setup for other scenes. Um, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, they're just, uh, it's essentially, uh, showing that Naomi's still kind of like, I think working on the, the ring gate problem. Oh, that's part um, of it. Okay. Yeah. She also has, she's got high resolution date, like, like Holden's going through and the whole ship is like, God damn, we missed a Pella. We're not going to, you know, like he's feeling the tension of his decision mm-hmm. and the fact that the crew is kind of not even Naomi's on board with it. And um, the fact that she's sifting through data about the, the battle they just fought in which he did a thing that he doesn't want anybody to know about. And yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of tension here about like, are they going to find out what I did? Which by the end of the episode, obviously that's all all cards right. on the table, but uh, it works uh, in the moment for sure. Uh, I also like Amos and Bobby talking about uh, you know in, in the the cargo bay, kind of uh, how pissed they are about, and you know she's Bobby's pissed off at her armor, and Amos is pissed off at his PDC cannon, and mm-hmm. he's like, "You still pissed off about the Pella?" And Amos, uh, his mm-hmm, when she asked him about, it, I thought it was really good, and then. You know, they spend a minute listening to one of uh, Alex's old country western hits. Like, if you remember, I think it's a season three, one early episodes where he was kind of alone in the Rossi uh, yeah. while they were down on Ganymede, kind of losing his mind. This is the song when he was like, I don't know, spraying <laughs> Red Bull in the cabin and slurping it down and do it. This this was what was playing. And I, I like it. Uh, I do, too. Yeah, it's a great the story about like that's all he played when they were on the Razorback and like claim that there was no other music. It's yeah, <laughs> the torch, that's, yeah, yeah. That's really good. It's a little character moment for a dead character. And then singing the song together, just taking the time to do it. It's because again, Alex is Alex died hero. It's mm-hmm. a damn shame about what the other guy did. But uh, I liked it the way that the show is finding a way t- to help us all kind of like get peace with that and give him some of these kind of nice character moments with him being dead and off screen. Yeah. So, and again, six episodes, you could cut a lot of this shit and they're not doing it. And I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but then the other bit- thing that I like is when Claire finds out this information, she's like, Oh, I look what I discovered here. She's like, this is way above my pay grade. She wants nothing to do with this. Like the situation, the tenuous situation she's in, like being almost a full crew member here. Like, mm-hmm. She does not want to confront Captain Holden with the fact that she knows what he did. It would just, yeah, that one, like, she doesn't think it would go well for her. Well, it's, it's that, but there's also an element that she, uh, she um, goes into more detail further in the episode where, because she's like, it's this way above my pay grade. And also I'm not judging and I'm not, I don't think she's, that's as the tactic. I think that she's really had some come to Jesus moments about violence and death and, and choosing oh, yeah, that over sure. life. Um, and I think that all ties again, it's very economical because this, this thing's fucking burning at 15 G's, but mm-hmm. they are not really skimping on the character moments. They just, they're yeah. just like incidental and you have to catch them in, in passing kind of like <laughs> catching up to Marco's spin depot. Um, oh, God. speaking of Marco, he's on deck of the Pella just raging uh, still smarting over his humiliating defeat. He's issuing orders for executions for senior uh, uh, crew members of the other ships. And Philip begins his new job after being demoted from the bridge as junior repair technician. Yeah, Marco's on full tilt here. Like he he's just, he's rattled. He's rattled by Holden. Holden gave him that look through the, the camera. And Marco's just like, God, I, I don't know if I can beat this guy now. Yeah. Really, really has got uh, him mentally dominated. And and mm-hmm. Marco is so fragile and so kind of fraught and rudderless that he doesn't even realize the. The viewpoint that he's letting the crew ex- get themselves exposed to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah, Rosenfeld brings it up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, she doesn't bring it up to him. She brings it up to uh, uh, the, the Philip. Because mm-hmm. Philip goes to get his new orders from this guy. I thought that was great that this this guy's kind of like, you know, where the fuck you been? He realizes it's Philip Anaros and suddenly goes uh-huh. into like, 
you know, toady mode, and <laughs> Philip's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. You're gonna have to be the boss of me. And like, what kind of yeah. like a weird situation that must be for this guy? Uh-huh. But yeah, Renfield puts all this on this little. I, I don't like. I can't remember if he's supposed to be 16 or 18, but putting a lot on this kid's shoulder. Like, hey, you're responsible yeah. for your grown ass father's emotional stability, and if he's not stable, we all gonna die. So see to that kid. <laughs> yeah, I just Philip's not very good at that either. I I don't know. Well, his father doesn't take him serious, and I think mm-hmm. that's one of the problems. But also, it's just uh, and well, then that, she's, that's man, like part of the support, right? Like there, there's an element of like because be, because Marco, I don't I don't know. Marco likes kind of not taking Philip seriously. Likes being oh yeah, you know the one in charge here. That power dynamic, that that like competency dynamic. He kind of gets off on that. So that uh-huh. is part of like what Philip does to support him is just be there to get shit on sometimes. Yeah. So like, yeah, yeah, that's a rough position for Philip to be in for sure. And uh, this Rin fair lady, she's, uh, you know, mm-hmm. got kind of gives the opposite equal thing that Marco does where instead of like building him up and then tear- or tearing him down and building him up, she like, waits for him to like try to flex his ego on her. Like, you know, I, why should I listen to you? I just shoot you in the face. What do you think my father do? And she just echoes back what he yeah. did when he did a, you know, like when he shot his friend in the face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you just going to keep, you know, and it just really blowing him up on his bullshit. It's interesting. It's interesting as one to, you know, daddy, stepmommy kind of dynamic that they got here going. Um, yeah. And then the third kind of aspect of that is the, guy who is his boss now but realizes hey this is the the leader of the free navy's kid and i can't really order him around but i need to order him around there's a weird mix there too which i liked yeah uh but what what whatever you you think about this uh this this blonde lady with a fierce neck tattoo she is damn good at shutting down anaros bullshit Mm -hmm. all day every day yeah she's just shutting it down like a pdc cannon for their bullshit uh out on the hull of the Rasinanti, Amos is forced to confront Holden about him pulling their punches while they repair a PDC. I I like this scene a lot. Um, mostly because it ends the way it does. I think that's a great line from Amos. Um, where he says, are you not going to, are you pissing me for asking or are you pissed because you don't have an explanation to give? Uh and and it ends right there because it has to, right? Like, the, what is the next step here? Amos is going to attack him. He's going to like kick him into space. What? And they're what over happens? that. They're over. Yeah, that. yeah. That's not you know? the relationship. But like, there there's there's a tension there, right? There's like a course correction that Amos sort of puts Holden back on because mm-hmm. he forces Holden to confront the fact that he did this purely for personal reasons, and and this was in fact a mistake. And I don't know if it's intentional, but like the way Amos brought this up, I thought was a masterclass in having a difficult conversation because you always have a torch act- in your hand. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Whenever you're going into a potential confrontation, always have a torch. Yep. Yeah, you have you have a certain moral authority over someone when you have right. an industrial weapon that you uh-huh. can wield against them. Um, but him saying, like, do you want me to lock you out of fire control? It's not an accusation. Uh-huh. It's not a uh, it's not a it's not a fishing expedition. It's a statement of like, I know what you did. It was bad. And here's something we could do to fix it. And we don't have to talk about it. Just I'll lock you out of fire control. You can still be the captain. And then we won't you won't be tempted to do this bullshit anymore. Mm-hmm. Like it's and it and it, it is completely caught holding with no room to maneuver because all of his like yeah. defensive bullshit in the face of Amos just stating like, hey, I, I'm not making accusations. I'm not casting judgment. I'm just telling you how I feel about the situation and what it makes out me. And yeah, and, and, and it led up to, like you said, Amos having the, are you mad because I'm asking? Or are you mad because you don't even know? Um, or you're I mean, embarrassed such, to tell us. Yeah, It's such an Amos way to approach this, right? It's matter of fact. It's, it's devoid of most of the emotion. Yeah, it feels right for that character. Meanwhile, back on the Pella, or I guess outside the Pella, Philip is getting a lesson on hull repair from this. I didn't catch this guy's name. Uh, uh, this fucking new guy, the FNG, I'm going to call him. Yeah. Uh, maybe le- learns a thing or two about the types of belters that live on places like Sirius Station. 
And mm-hmm. as we mentioned previously, it seems to contradict a whole lot of what his father said about them being greedy and weak. Yeah, I, I think he's bonding with real belters. Um, he's he's understanding, you know, what makes them tick and not just getting a. I, I talked about, you know, Marco's no true belter uh, stuff last episode. Right. And I feel like that is what he's been feeding to Philip for his entire life. Um, and so now getting to like sit down with them and really talk to them, he's seeing that they're not actually anything like what his father says, um, or at least not all of them are. Yeah. The other thing I really like about this scene is Philip taking pleasure in repairing something instead of destroying something. And that is, it, I, I think emotionally that is where they're trying to take Philip. Yeah, and, and it also is, uh, you know, the pine cone didn't fall far from the tree. Like, you know, uh, Naomi had a, a, an intuitive aptitude and grasp of engineering and starship repair and things like that. And it seems like that Philip, uh, you know, that we, we saw him, you know, I think we, he was field stripping some piece of equipment when we first got our first substantive introduction to him. Uh, there's been signs that he is kind of Naomi's kid after all. Like Marco's had a really far head start, but he just can't quite outrun uh, that that the spark that he got from his mother. And I, I, I think, number one, that's bullshit. I don't <laughs> I don't think you get genetic goodness from somebody, but mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a fiction. T- and it's working on that kind of metaphoric level, you know, mm-hmm. Um I also think you're right. One hundred percent right on about this. No true belter like. The Belter has a distinct culture and it's a culture of like, you know, taking care of one another, making sure everyone is, you know, being to look after um, uh, inclusiveness and Marco shit sounds good because you can start pairing away. Well, we don't care about this station because they're a bunch of well wallow. Oh, we don't care about this station because, you know, they're too afraid to lift their hand against inners. But Mm -hmm. and what. You know, and you, you start like I think you even said last episode that like what Marco thinks of a belter is the people that are on the Pella and maybe just Marco and Philip and maybe <laughs> push comes to shove just Marco. Yeah, just fucking Marco. And I think right. this is Philip realizing that like, holy shit, not even on the Pella amongst our gallant crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like I, I can I can find the, the defeater for my dad's argument just here in his rando guy. And, right. and the other thing is like. So what if his brother was big and strong and gone on to the belt? This guy would have been dead or on a prison barge. Mm-hmm. So like there's always costs to these things. If you if you go to choose to make war, what are you, you know, choosing not to do? This goes back to Eisenhower's famous Iron Cross speech he gave on his farewell address to like, you know, like every every bomber we build is a high ah. school that didn't get built. Every Right. Uh, every battalion of tanks is 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 a hundred miles of interstate highway that doesn't connect our cities. Like he just listed off like the cost, of, and it's like you know if we don't watch, we'll. He said he's like it's uh, I forget he said, but it's like the the total sum of these expenditures is essentially an iron cross that all of humanity hangs from. And Philip is kind of like learning that like these yeah what what are we sacrificing for focusing on these other things? And it's great. Yeah, I, I thought this. These are great. These are great scenes. They're economical and they're building on everything we know about the setting and these characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on back to the Rossinanti, Holden has to come clean to Naomi about why he spared Marco and the Pella, and she's not happy about the position it's putting herself in. Uh, I had a I had a good time with Naomi catching this coffee. I, I feel like this shows just how comfortable she is on ships, right? Like there's, they do a lot of visual stuff with belters, but this to me strikes as like totally belter. She knows exactly, she can almost tell by the rumble of the engine how much acceleration they're going to put on and then how fast that cup's going to fall and where she needs to grab. She doesn't even look at it. It's, I don't know, little stuff like that is really cool to me in this it, world. It reminds me of I saw this video of a cook cooking in like a container ship that was going through like 60 foot waves. Oh, yeah. Under siege. I saw that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the documentary. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but this guy was just like in, in like when you see it, um, you know, just shot from the camera's perspective, it looks like this guy just lurching from station to station. Then they, they showed they went back and rewound the scene and image stabilized it. Uh So you see like just what his body is doing to stay like upright and like just how instinctive it is. Like, you know, he's just kind of rolling. And this is Naomi like in ones. 
one smooth motion as soon as gravity comes on she's just ready to grab that coffee bulb out of the sky it's and it's it's great it's a seamless uh, seamless effect it is yeah i loved it uh and then the scene you know gets i think better from there i think better um it's a confrontation that needed to happen and we were all kind of wondering last episode what could what could possibly be a reasonable excuse from Holden to Naomi about this because Naomi doesn't want Holden to protect her, let alone need it. Uh, I feel like everybody came out of this, like making their case and I didn't feel like anybody was necessarily in the wrong. They just all had their own reasons for doing the things they did. I don't agree with all of them. I don't agree with Holden disabling this warhead at all, but he had his reason and I think it is a valid one to him. So and I it's right. It. I think he's one. I think that him killing yeah. Marco. Oh, or, God. That's the and, end of their relationship. It kills that relationship, too. Yeah. 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 And, it, and, it, and it, it maybe not it. right away. No, sure. But like, yeah, you'd have to be a very strong person to, you know, like, like they, they, they talk about that's one of the things that kills relationships, the death of a child. Mm-hmm. Well, if your mate is the one who killed the child, then like it's even more. So like I think, but yeah, like, like in Breaking Bad, the the counselor, right? Uh, that dude ended up like backing over his child or yeah, something. Killed, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the relationship everything. died. Yeah. So sure, sure. So like I think he's right. It's just like so. So here's the thing. I actually really like this scene, and I was getting excited because I'm like, holy shit! What what should happen here is Holden should give command to Naomi. And I'm like, I thought because like, yeah. you know, they've always made a case that she's a pretty good second officer. And, you know, maybe she was a little bit more sen- uh, sentimental about Belters. And maybe she's a bit like at this point, she was ready. She was ready to see her son die. I kind of thought that like what he'd be do is like, you know what? I'll be your exo, which would return to the theme of like him, you know, like like his proper place and him not wanting to be the leader from the and like turning full circle. Naomi's ready for command and she like it's the perfect way. It's like, well, if, if Philip yeah. dies, it'll be under your hand. Yeah, I was support, but I'm, I was I was your support and steady rock. I wasn't the aggressor. I thought it was the perfect way. And I, I was getting really excited and then it didn't happen. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, well, fuck, because now it's just, well, huh. holding selfish and wrong and uh-huh. Naomi is strong yeah. and right, but they're still going to have the weak. You know, like like Marco, uh, say what you will. He has eliminated the weak links or the perceived weak links in his rank. Uh, I just don't know, because like Holden, what's he just going to going to do the thing next time? Because I don't think the math changed. That's what he promises in the book. I I don't know. I won't say anything about how it turns out, but like. Yeah, and he doesn't promise it here, right? Like, I don't. He doesn't make any promises. He's not like, oh, next time I'll do it or next time I'll give you fire control or something. It's just kind of like I did this thing. Here's why I did it. I don't like that you did that thing. Yeah, I don't need you to protect me, all that stuff. And then they leave it there. So I didn't feel like anything got resolved in this That's scene other thing. than all the cards are now on the table. They understand how each other feels about it. I agree 100%. I thought that's why it felt a little unsatisfying to me is I yeah. thought it was building to something that would, you know, synthesize all the information out of all the cards around the table. What is the best hand? And instead, it's just like, well, we'll just play in the same way next time. And hopefully Holden will uh, call instead of fold, I guess. Yeah. No, you need Amos to walk in at the end of that scene and be like, so we're taking you off fire control, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sure. I don't know, because, again, I, I think Holden's right. Like, I don't see how Naomi overlooks or forgives this and, and he's not ready. You know, it's, it's such a contrast between the certainty, almost the psychopathic or pathological certainty of the Martian Admiral Quarte uh, <laughs> sure. and, and Holden, ready to sacrifice entire worlds to see his will done. And Holden, who can't yeah. even sacrifice a relationship with uh, with a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the if, if this mercy uh, overcoming his wrath ends up being a big plot point later on the season. Uh, back on the Pella, Philip's new repair mentor pulls an explosive prank on him while they continue repairing the stricken vessel. Yeah, and they see that it was it was disarmed, right? And there's more information about this later uh, in another quick scene. But yeah, it was disarmed. They think it's. A fail safe, but you know, I, I, I and I wonder what Marco will think of this. Is is Marco even gonna 
give a shit enough to to start to process the fact that Holden spared him. I don't think this information gets to Marco. I think Marco you stops think so? with like Mar- Marco and Naros is blessed. I don't need the that, that's you, you come to the right. It's it's Philip that continues gotcha. to work through what this means oh, for in, sure. in his mind. So he's, he's going to deal with that. And we get to a scene here in a second of it. But yeah. yeah, I wasn't sure like what the joke was. Like, did this guy know? Like, did he see the warhead disarmed LED and was just fucking with uh-huh. Philip? Because like Philip was thinking that this might go off you know i'm <laughs> yeah he knew like, he's got a live fish dude it's a nuke you're uh yeah this is in jurassic park where uh where grant is climbing the electric fence or <laughs> he, he goes up to it and he's like yeah blah, 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 and the kids <laughs> are like ah. all right we rejoin the action as drummer and walker are floating in deep space preparing to lead a joint assault strike on one of marco's supply depots before they meet stiffer resistance than they expected The raid proves costly with one crew member dead and drummer's right hand man, Joseph, losing his uh, he loses his right arm. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that thing's done. Uh, An arm and a life is the cost of this operation. What's what's the harder slam moment in this scene? Is it when the crate slams down on his arm for the second time (laughs) or is it when they grapple onto the the spinning the revolving station and smash wow, onto the surface that I, looked painful they yeah. looked it looked lethal is what it yeah. looked to me i i don't they they made them go too hard on this the station was spinning too fast i think they were so. too far away they're too much too much yeah, yeah, you know what let's talk about this because like it, it, one thing about the screeners is like you know we're watching these things in isolation i can't just like go to a thread to see you know like if there's an astrophysicist uh, opining about the velocities and stuff um wh- how do you dock with so so this this uh supply depot is two massive balls of con- cargo containing ships attached with a str- very must be an immensely strong tether and then spinning. Mm-hmm. And I I think I think I've read somewhere that you want to spin stabilize almost everything in space because you get like gyroscopic scopic stabilization along at least one axis for free when you do that. Mm-hmm. And it's easier to station keep when you just have to worry about two dimensional position keeping rather than three dimensional. So like I understand why he takes the time to spin it up. Plus also if you're going to have crew people standing there, it's always better to have gravity than not because we're supposed to you know, or biology is dependent on it. Mm-hmm. But damn, how do you dock with this fucking thing? Like, I'm trying to think of like how you get into a straight line yeah. acceleration on the inside of it to where you can dock and take advantage. Like it, it seems insane. Like, I, do, do you think the station slows down uh, and, and, and goes kind of on the float and then they dock and then it speeds back up? Because, yeah, I don't see how anything docks with this. It seems insane. <laughs> yeah. Normally, when you see something spinning, you'll have a central uh point of of like docking right like you can go to the center of this thing yes it'll be spinning but you can spin your ship at the same rate yeah and dock with it this you can't because you'll be changing direction or just things like Tycho that have those giant arms that kind of look violent like snatch the ships out like you kind of roughly match speed and then it's automatic arms just come and snatch you um, I, yeah, I, I, when I saw how hard they hit, I'm like, damn, how do you even, how is this supposed to work? Cause obviously they're, right. they're attacking it when it's, uh, maybe it's another reason to spin it up. It makes it harder to, to assault in that way, but yeah, you could um, slow it, you could slow it for sure. Um, I think so. And if you're, you're going to visit, you could probably fill it, you know, it's, uh, it's tanks back up with more spin juice if it needs. So I'll tell you the way to not dock with it is to fire a grapple, uh, at it and then slam onto its surface at yeah, 100 I, I would miles try an hour. To, I don't to, know. To, to match its straight line speed. And, uh-huh. and the thing is, like, I think, like, if you had a grappling system, maybe you could cushion a blow a little bit with that, too, you know, to where, uh, but, but yeah, I, it, it, it spools out more at big, you know, instead of just like, oh, I'm hard tethered crunk. I, it, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it seems like you'd take injuries, if nothing else. For sure. Uh, and then the next line is just like them totally normal talking through their helmets, their, their yeah. helmet mics. So they've yeah. not had any problem smashing down. And but the second smash was brutal as well. That crate coming down on his arm again. <sighs> I laughed out loud because of how I don't know, hardcore this was. 
Yeah, it's uh, and I'm like, once they got the thing off and like she got the, I'm like, why don't you just pull him out, man? But I guess like he was still smashed a little bit further back. Or, Maybe. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, like uh, some brutal field amputations. <laughs> the, uh, probably the most brutal thing we've seen since uh, season one when the, the medic, was it, got his head shot off? Well, the belter who shot the gate the first time, I think that's the goriest oh, thing I've yeah. ever seen on this show. Him yeah, just getting it's hard pulped. to actually see, <laughs> but yes, you're right. What's that's funny the is like me and Jack watched that when we were watching through. We watched it back and I was rewinding and like trying to I'm like I happened to pause at <laughs> a moment where his face and eyeballs were detaching oh, and no. they modeled a surprising amount. Of this young man disintegrating, if you want to frame awesome. by frame it in 4K. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they, they, so like, so there's there's a lot of stuff here because you know, as Marco's Depot, it, you you might have all the time in the world, but they engineered a situation where there's people on board. Like, why are people on board? They realize mm -hmm. they see that they're working on a manifest or getting ready for a pickup. That means there is an unknown. You know, you can't just fuck around all the time out here. Uh, so it gives it a little bit of urgency and then turns out, you know, there's people there and they're they're booby trapping things. Uh, I, I like it. And I, again, I like, you know, I'm a big Master and Commander fan. I, I like a good field amputation scene. Uh, man, that arm, that yeah. grizzled stump. I'm telling you. I just don't know where they sawed like a Cornish hen in half and shoved it down this guy's <laughs> sleeve or what, but it was authentically bio biologically gory oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, really gross you know the other thing i realized in the scene is because they've like michio has been kind of like the butt of everything this season like she's the one that fucks up under pressure she's the one that can't hit the button right she's the one but she gets this nice moment where like as a medic she knows exactly what to do mm -hmm. and everybody else is doing the wrong thing and like losing their mind and like being squeamish and she's the one that is in charge and doing and, and saving lives and just kind of goes to show like, yeah, maybe her forte is not like death and destruction and combat, but mm -hmm. look at her in a life saving role. Like it's it's yeah. an interesting and then they they don't make a big deal out of it. It's just there to notice like she does have a core competency and it's it's very strong. It's just not in the death dealing department. Yeah, no, they're, they're really leaning into the, you know, reaching for violence stuff that they're they're talking about with Holden a few seasons ago. Uh, and bring back up in this episode. It's kind of all over this this episode. Yeah. Uh, back on board the Rossinanti, Bobby just cannot believe their run of luck. The millions of one odds that went against them in that last battle. And uh, Peaches uh, stays behind in the galley to level with Holden about her thoughts on taking versus sparing life that she's accumulated in these last few seasons. So... What do you think about the idea that he shouldn't tell Bobby anything? The rest of the crew knows he's not going to tell Bobby. I think in general, people that you care about, you should be 100% honest. Um, but this is also a military situation where like you, this one of the very few situations like crises and military things like that, where like, you know, you have immediate life and death at hand. Are some of the few things where you can with a straight face say like, hey, we can't be open and honest with the public. We have to keep secret some things we have to and like, I don't know, because Bobby is dealing with her own shit and I don't mm -hmm. know what she thinks about this. Yeah, She's Bobby has a, a, a rage boner here for uh -huh. like killing belters at the moment. And I feel like. She might just break Holden in half if he tells her what he did. Yeah, she might bone tomahawk him. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I because that's what my thought is. Like, yeah, I don't like it, but like, also, uh, it's 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 it, it'd be touch and go with her, um, for sure. And they don't have like the relationship that you know her and Alex. Had, she's not in her, the crew, right? She she's no. in the crew with some of the crew, but yeah, you know, like Amos, for instance, right? The, the, those two are getting along swimmingly, but like. Holden doesn't really talk to Bobby much, at least lately. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I wondered that myself, like what kind of repercussions that will have um, when, if this gets out to Bobby or because, yeah, she's clearly the one that's most pissed. You know, she's always been the most gung ho. 
you know, she is the one that's like, fuck it, we tried, <laughs> space them. Uh, and she just clearly can't, like, you know, like, all. It's, it's, it must be uniquely frustrating because she's so well-trained. She's got such a handle on the technology. Yeah. Uh, she's got such a great military mind. And, like, every single time she goes into official action, it's a f- clusterfuck. Like, she's yeah. fed to a protomolecule beast for a commercial, essentially, or a <laughs> whole squad. Uh-huh. Uh, she, she, she goes against billion, billion to one odds to not kill Marco. It must be really frustrating, especially yeah. when you pull off like yeah. malfunction, shit like that. Yeah. Especially with all the crazy shit they did do all the 180 no scopes, all with the rail uh-huh. gun, like everything. Yeah. And then the one thing, like she said, I was like, what was it? A billion, billion to one odds. It's yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's enough time left to start a big rift between Bobby and the other factions I, of the ship. So, right. That's the only like saving grace here is I don't think they have the time because it, 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 it might it's be one of those situations like where you fucker you everybody knows here except for me huh when were you gonna yeah. tell me yeah, yeah it might be narrative economy because like like they know that like if you told her you would have to give a scene where she would go and like can you believe like and like and they like I just we just don't have time for five minutes of Bobby coming to grips and like is it so like you know what just keep her in the dark there's only two more hours to get through she just won't find out. Yeah, we 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 tore down the the gym set. We can't have her go back there in the last two episodes. So. <laughs> right, she can't pump iron. Yeah, we repurposed that for the reactor or some shit. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the uh, uh, peaches and his? Uh, oh my god, this is. There's this look when Claire's like, "You want to know the time, uh, like the exact moment that I realized I didn't want to kill you," and there is this look from Holden. That says, okay, it's going to be one of those days. It's going to be one of those conversation kind of days, huh? Mm -hmm. Uh, It's so good. It's so good. I love, absolutely love what he does in this scene. What I love about it, and again, I don't know if you get this unless you've just watched the whole series over, but as soon as she opened her mouth and said, do you want to know the moment? I knew because they do this beautifully in season three, uh, completely non-verbally. Showing the scene of Holden and and Naomi talking and her realizing what a good guy James Holden is and making that snap decision on the bridge to like alter the calculus like, yeah, they never this is never explicitly told. But like, I think it says something that I knew immediately what she was going for just by watching the show. Mm-hmm. And watching everyone's performances and how it's direct. So like kudos to the, the like, like they 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 really are doing a great job in this, you know, fast but nostalgic season of making those callbacks and and we get it because the show's so good. Yeah, totally. Uh, I also really like the line, especially coming from Claire to where she says to Holden, don't ever feel bad about not killing someone. Um, you know, with everything she's been through and how her life was so fucked up by wanting to kill someone. And then realizing she couldn't kill that person and like everything good that's come from her not killing Holden. Right. I mean, he's done, he's done a lot of good stuff here after the fact. So I I don't know. I I really like that line. And I think it's kind of what Holden needs to hear at this point. Yeah. Someone who like, like, yeah, because because this thing is like, you know, I, I guess I didn't make the case, but he did make the case. This one person changed her whole affect and has now become a valuable yeah. ally um, and did her part to save the whole solar system based on uh-huh. With his, the dragon his, his, stuff. Yeah. his passion and uh-huh. his willingness to self-sacrifice. Yeah. So, you know, you did make a difference. Yeah, you changed, you changed the hearts and minds of people by not reaching for violence it's exactly what you were trying to do it's and it makes you wonder what the effect of the last punch that he's pulled is going to have even though it's a horseshit uh-huh. decision that you should never make in a rational world <laughs> right uh you know sometimes it's the 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 things you like the you know it goes back to the captain that i like so much of the martian fleet her not doing her not doing the thing that yeah. she should have done as a good soldier saved the system there it's like time and time again mm-hmm. Uh, we, we've had that in real life. Like, I don't know how many like instances I've read of like, you know, the Soviets getting a r- alert that we launched missiles at them and the person just be like, what the fuck? It's the middle of the night. We haven't had like we haven't been beefing like, mm-hmm. no, I'm not pushing a button. Get the fuck out of here. Like people like stopping and, and choosing to do something other than killing people like time and time again, change alters the course of history. 
And I think we're going to see the course of fake history being altered here. Yeah, um, they've really been leaning into that, right? I mean, the prax thing, too, where they're talking about, like, it, it takes good people. Um, that's what it always takes. Bobby says that, right? It's it, it's the person doing the thing that they probably shouldn't do in the situation, but is morally the right yeah. thing to do. Can we talk about uh, Peach's sodium intake? I feel like she's a prime candidate to have one of those still shots of her face with blood trickling out of her nose. You know, she, she's she's prime oh, candidate for stroking. being Alex. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even pressure. think about that. Do you think you think you someone got- that, that, that takes a half a cup of salt with their 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 belter <laughs> kibble is, is going to take a 14 G burn? <laughs> Fuck no. Yeah, actually, I never thought about it that way. You would want the lowest blood pressure possible if you're you, like a soldier, I would right? Think. I mean, you don't want to go for zero. No, That's... go for zero. Go for zero because you can't get there. It's unattainable. And and yeah. if, if you do get too low, they can just put you under acceleration, right? Like, let's just keep I, I, a ship. Let's yeah. put you in that spin station, spin a little bit faster. You're good. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to see, I see what the works. UN Surgeon General says about it because I, I don't know if those no, facts so, check out. But this is an enormous amount of salt. I don't know. Like, are, like, well, are this they just... is a callback to the last episode where Bobby was having trouble even gagging this shit down, right? Like, oh, it's another like this food's so terrible that like, yes, you just, she I mean, likes that's... it that way because it's the only way it's edible. Yeah, that's uh, speaking of the the old uh, age of sail Royal Marine Day, like mm. uh, what 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 you you always come across the idea that like uh. Uh, old sailors were drunk all the time because mm-hmm. they mixed alcohol with their water and lime juice so they didn't get scurvy and they also it would it, it would it would it would sterilize the shit that was growing in the water sure uh and two the, everything they ate was salty as fuck to keep it preserved over long transatlantic and pacific so like it's kind of interesting that like they're we're, we're going back like if they, if they start serving grog rations and eating hard tack, then yeah, we're just doing age of sail shit in space. Yeah. Uh, back on board, or I guess this is the series station on on uh, Avasaral's flagship. Monica previews her latest sympathy segment. This time, centering a narrative around a fat, lazy cat named Lucky Earther. <laughs> which, if 20th century Belter politics are anything like 21st century Twitter politics. Oh. Cat posting might very well turn the tide of public uh, opinion. We'll do it for each other, but for a cute cat, (laughs) fuck yes, we will. Sure. Also, much like him, I'm just tired of all the hate. That that feels so relevant right now. Like, Jesus, come on. Come on. What the hell are are we we all on, on this station of Earth together or not? Uh, We're not there yet. We're not, we're no, not done. We're not, we're not done. We're not done with the hate. We're not not, uh, not nearly done. Uh, people, 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 and that, that's a, that's a real problem. People are born fresh uh, with their hate ge- fate gauges completely unfilled every day. So sure. even if you could get everybody on, like, there's gonna be more assholes born uh, re- ready for the, to beat those hate boners. So it, yeah, it's 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 one of those things. It's like you know, like this is a pretty trite point that like any time in any conflict, if you pause for a moment, you ask people on the sides, like. Jesus, are you tired of the death? You tired? Almost everyone's like, yes, of course. Oh my God, this is mm-hmm. terrible. But like, ask the question of like what you're willing to sacrifice, what point of negotiation are you willing to concede to? In and then it's uh it's a much harder uh, question. Sure. But uh yeah, uh if you, if you can get the sides the the especially when you're trying to unite them against a greater threat, um I think I think you got a a, a much greater shot. And if you can get these belters to understand. Marco is a traitor and a coward. And if there's only some strong spokesperson in the belt that can like call him out on that shit and humiliate him publicly and crack his facade of invincibility, maybe a, a belter that defies him. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe you would have something here. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. What did you think of Monica's point about weakness that you gotta, you gotta uh, let yourself be weak uh, to humanize yourself and to humanize your opponent. Uh, I took this more as uh, when she says like someone somebody needs to hear that she's saying Avasarala needs to hear it. Uh, it goes both ways. Yeah, yeah, because she's she's just uh, it's, uh, denying some of the obvious facts as well. But I don't know because that's the thing they've also told is like you know maybe Avasarala has clarity of purpose, but those Martians seem pretty hell bent on killing people. Some of those UN soldiers were you know hey like, why are we here? you know I thought we were supposed to come here to kill the like you do need to have because you know 
yeah, you got this crisis on Ceres, but you also have the crisis on Earth. Like, you got to continue building yeah. these bridges both ways. And Monica is the, the voice of reason in the room. Who saw that coming? <laughs> Remember how annoying she was in season yeah. three? What boy, the camera fingers guy. I didn't. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, didn't think I'd come around on her uh, at all, but eventually, yeah, I did. And it's not just the words in the, the, the fat cat. It's also the footage of Belters pulling, you know, UN troops out of wreckage, UN troops pull, pulling Martians and mm-hmm. Martians helping Bell, like everyone like they and they're they're crafty in the way they, they shot these scenes. Like, I think every faction helped every other faction out. You know, nice. all the combinations of rock, paper, scissors are represented. And uh, that's yeah, that's probably effective sympathy package. We'll see. We'll see if the sympathy bomb. Uh, what kind of what kind of positive damage it can do? Uh, speaking of a strong spokesman for the the rest of the belt, uh, drummer publicly shames and declares personal war on Marco Aneros before utterly despoiling one of his uh, depots. Uh, yeah, I, is she gonna? Surely she's gonna take these supplies and give them back to Ceres, right? It's the only way that Ceres survives at this point, in my opinion. I saw that they, they follow one of the ends of the tether flying off and it's accompanied yeah. by a ship. Uh-huh. I'm guessing that this ship is going to come like that. They, they plot a trajectory that's going to bring them close to series. And uh-huh. like this thing is going to come in right as things are getting really bad. And it's a perfect solution. It's not the inner saving them. Right. It's the Belters saving themselves. But it's not Marco's Belters. It's not saving Marco. Them. It's yeah, Belters it's... calling Marco out for his bullshit right. and saying, I am the one that's actually going to help. And it's Belters helping Belters. Yeah. The inners are going to support. It's it's actually shaping up really beautifully. <laughs> this is kind of exactly what Avasarala needs. Yeah. And it's, she needs she a had win. nothing to do with it, which I no. kind of like too. It it feels like earlier seasons where things happen that are sort of out of control of the people who need those things to happen yeah. or, or, you know, just coincidences turn into game changing events. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. I like that stuff. I was wondering if you could maybe spoil something from the books. Uh, I noticed that Michio had slapped a back to tank on uh, Joseph's arm. Oh yeah. And it's like, there was like some kind of tint, like, are they, I didn't think that they'd be well healed enough to regrow an arm. Maybe this is something they stole from Marco's Depot, like some Martian regrowth tech, but like. Proto molecule uh, back to tank. I, no, I, 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 I don't know. Say, do you know anything about no, the I regrow? Don't. Okay. Like, I, uh, I, I was wondering about that. Um, also, um, I, this is an, it's got to be an intentional nod to George Martin, if not the double D's, but, uh, drummer says, you know, you've sent you, uh, come after me, but yet I'm still unbent, unbroken, unbowed. These are the house mm-hmm. words of house Martell. If you've watched game of Thrones, uh, you know, Prince Ober, this, yeah, this, this, this harkens back to that. And it's a deliberate reference. It's got to be, it's got to be Gotta a be. tip of the, it might be, uh, I don't know if it's a respectful tip of the cap. It might be like, hey, look at us uh, finishing our series in style. <laughs> we finished a book series and we're getting two of the trilogies out. Boom, you know. I uh, mean, uh, Martin could say, well, at least I finished a show. <laughs> it didn't get well, canceled twice. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't yeah, think it's a very good yeah, shot I mean, <laughs> if it is a shot, but sure. We're throwing stones and glass uh, have yeah. enclosures. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. Right. But it's, it's probably uh, it's probably more friendly. I um, think so. Yeah, they, they worked with with Martin in some capacity. Well, yeah, weren't they like didn't the they get their start as like editors or, or uh, of some of his stuff? So like uh-huh. this might be just like not even about the double D's and the fucking HBO show, but just like a yeah. nod back to the old man himself. I think so. I think it's friendly. Uh, meanwhile, Marco pours over ship designs while Rosenfeld gives him a dose of the cold, hard truth for which he expects a rich reward. Governorship of Medina Station after the war has been won. Yeah. Control of, of the show point of the universe at that, at that point. Uh, yeah. No, that's, that's a pretty big ask. I, I don't know. I, I, I can't really say much. I can't say much about this. It's all mildly interesting to me. She's very ambitious. She sees a mm-hmm. gap because, you know, uh, Coral is dead. Uh, Sin is dead. Marco is sulking around below decks, repair, doing minor, you know, doing maintenance work. 
Uh, no one is left to check him, and Marco's not one to be checked, but he needs it, so she steps up and do- does it, and just when, you know, he's in smack or down mode, she goes and asks for, like, the biggest, uh, jewel in the solar system. Uh, she's, you know, the ovaries on the, on this lady, uh, well, I, I like how she appeals to his ego here, right? Like, um, she does something to defy him, and she spins it to yeah, say that this God is actually it. going to make you a bigger hero than you were before to these people. I, I, I've, I've just helped you, you know, boost your image, and that's what exactly what he wants. It's the only thing he cares about. Yeah, she puts herself in a spin and fires all PDC cannons, just <laughs> shooting down this bullet. But she's she's really you're right. She she's great at controlling him and manipulating. She him. is and, and controlling him by by puffing him up and and also like you know uh, defying him strategically. It's uh, she's doing a really good job. And there's yeah these scenes are just dripping with sexual tension, I, which I don't get because I don't like what I I'm, mean Marco what? is right. Marco's a yeah, Marco goes around with a, a lot of sexy swagger. man. Yeah, sure. he's got. Uh, but like, where's this going? Like, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I thought they were going to like, but I, I always thought that from the beginning. It's like, okay, we got this super sexualized Belter, second in command. You got the super sexualized Supreme Commander of the Free Navy. Uh, you know, Marco is always looking like a treat. Like, yeah, they're probably there's a sexual tension probably, but like they're not. So like, I wonder why they injected mm-hmm. the sexual tension in the first place. Doesn't seem like it's going to pay off. Seems a little borderline yeah. unprofesh, but um, I don't know. Maybe that's part of her appeal. Um, so is there anything else? Oh, I, I guess, yeah, that she's like also she saved him from himself because, you know, he's doing this dramatic raging out and she defied his uh, orders to spare the captain of the Granica. Um, and and uh, but they do space the the commander of the uh, uh, Loba. Um, yeah, that, that's the other thing about Rosenfeld. I feel like she's actually running the. She, she's, I mean, she's running the war. She's running the Belter faction that is, you know, allied with the the Free Navy at this point because she is manipulating Marco, and she needs Marco in a way, right? Like Marco's image is not just self serving for him. It's also something she's using as a tool to control the rest of the belt. So yeah, I feel like she's the one in actual power. Um, she's the power behind the throne sort of thing. Um, and, and they're doing a really good job of showing that and, and not necessarily like telling me that like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, have aspirations to run this thing. She's just kind of doing it. There's also, I think, um, I, it's just last year I watched the Dan Carlin's hardcore history on the war in the Pacific. And I think that this campaign is uh, on the belt is m- most closely relates to the Island hopping campaign that you're, you know, the allies are trying mm-hmm. to secure each individual base for staging for more operations. And they're, they're trying to, f- uh, you know, uh, frustrate that including the attack on the mainland that was hoping to pin them down. Like there's a lot of, yeah. and one of the things that like, uh, didn't help to the, the Imperial Japan losing the war is that when their commanding officers would lose a battle, even when it was against overwhelming odds and, uh, there was really nothing they could do better. Like it was seen as routine that they would commit suicide or, mm-hmm. you know, be disgraced otherwise. And like, even brilliant commanders are going to lose every once in a while. And if you take your yeah. best and brightest and you kill them av- after every defeat, you eventually get your second best and brightest, your third best and brightest, you're inexperienced, you're, you know, people are willing to tell <laughs> bullshit and bravado. So like, I wonder yeah. if they're telling that a little bit too, that Marco is, you know, burning, you know, you know, you, the, 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 his, his military candle at both ends, you know, not only are they incurring losses because they're against a, a larger supplied, better organized foe, Mm-hmm. But also when he gets them into trouble and they can't shoot their way out of, he blames everybody else. And now you got oh, yeah. the second in command uh, taking it into battle next time. So I don't know. It might be a little interesting historical uh, parallel. Uh, then Philip sees drummer's message along with the rest of the Pella's crew in the mess hall. And he's forced to improvise a Marco esque rallying speech to keep morale strong. I, has Philip convinced himself actually that he's at a point of no return? Because essentially that's what he's saying in this, or is this all mm. bluster and and it's, you it's know, trying to make good on what Rosenfeld told him earlier and all that? It's tough because I 
there's two things happening here. Number one, uh, the fucking new guy comes up and is like, you'll never believe. It looks like, uh, we know, we looked at the tele- telemetry of this torpedo and it looks like it was disabled intentionally. Who would do that? And of course, right. you know, he sees it as like some kind of miracle, but you can see the wheel spinning and fill up. I was like, I know exactly the type of person that would do that. And it's my mom. Uh-huh. Um, and I don't know. Like, I, I think he was just close, uh, you know, like, like being uh, handed firsthand evidence that his father's full of shit about serious people. And they shouldn't have been abandoned. They're full of genuine beltas, belt, real belt mm-hmm. And the fact that like, you know, uh, his hated adversary spared him in the way that his father would never, never. Yeah. I thought he was right on there, but the, the unfortunately he found uh-huh. the intoxicating effect of narcissistic supply that like, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to give a dad speech and you can tell like, like that's, that's the, that's, that's the medication that's going to make all the pain go away as everybody looking to you for strength and support. And you're the one providing it. Like, I, I think he's gotten high off that supply and we've he had one step forward, two steps back. Yeah, I, I don't know where this kid's going to land. I, I think uh, I, I think narratively it's cleaner if if he ends up uh, and I, we, I think we said this at the start of season five, like this is shaping up to where like, I don't know that you can ever forgive a guy like Philip um, for all the sins he's committed, but a heroic sacrifice at the end, like a Darth Vader turning on the emperor situation sure, yeah. seems like it's the way to go. And with two episodes left, like I, there's one more time for a one step back. Uh, and maybe it's even him synthesizing. If I, if I put the big forehead take on this, like uh, he's synthesizing what Rosen Rosenfeld is saying and what his father said. And like, and he's like, ah, I need to get my dad's in, in back in my dad's inner circle so that I can better betray him. Like, is there any of that going on in the wheels? I don't think so. I think he's just sees his dad weak and a way for him to get back in his good graces. And he's still processing what he's learned about the torpedo. But maybe he's that smart. I, I won't say what I was disappointed by, but I remember being profoundly disappointed with the way that Philip's storyline concludes in book six. Oh, no. Now, I haven't read beyond that. I don't. I don't know if there's more going on there. Oh no. But I, but I, I was profoundly <laughs> disappointed is all I can really say huh. without giving away too much. Uh, okay. I hope they go a different direction. I hope they do something definitive and narratively satisfying. Like you're talking about as opposed to just sort of doing what they did in the book, which may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this happened earlier, but, I remember being disappointed. Hmm. That's uh, mildly interesting all around. Um, Kamina's uh, the drummer's speech. Holy shit. Uh, uh, yeah, I want to see it, the full the full thing here, right? We got a yeah. teaser of it earlier yeah. on in the less, it's, 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 it's I a guess, message, inflammatory it's a so nice, bit. It's a diss so nice, they play it twice. Uh, uh-huh. You know, and then and getting to the unbroken, unbowed, unbent thing. It's like, you know, you stole from your own. You abandoned Sears to the yeah, inner. You this. called yourself champion and then ran. So go ahead, raise your bounties, hunt me, mm-hmm. kill me if you can. But know that you will always be, I will always be the one who took back what you stole. <laughs> Live shamed, die empty. Uh. Kamina Drummer <laughs> did this to you. Like, it, it is... Yeah, like I love Walker's like ah oh, so much for anonymity. Like yeah, like this is right. and, and it, it all stemmed from her having this really thoughtful look at Michio and uh uh Joseph. Like mm, you know, she's yeah. she's seeing her taking like I I I this is like it feels like it's a place coming from love of belters. Yes, and these are the people genuine we're fighting outrage for. at what a perversion of their religion culture that mm-hmm. Marco represents. Like, yeah, inner suck. And we should never forget that. But this is not the way, you yeah. know, this is the opposite of the way I, I it's yeah. Belters for belters. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and the, the actor playing drummer, I can't remember her name at the moment, uh, is Kara G. K- yes. Kara. Is it G or G? I, I don't even know. I did. Oh, shit. Uh, I famously mispronounced things. So probably G. I, I thought it was G. G. Um, but she's fantastic in this. Uh, she she always like it's such a weird dynamic uh, her her as an actor her as a person the the actor and then this character feels so different she's such a good oh, actor yeah. Um, yeah. but man she brings that 
that authority and that that self righteous or not, not even self righteous that just righteous righteous anger. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah it's yeah. just straight up righteous um I loved it I love this scene I love this speech um you know they announced this last week course, this will be a couple weeks back in in real time uh, we got time deletion we were fucking out fucking out in the outer planets uh yeah. but. But they announced that there's going to be a Telltale uh, video mm-hmm. game, and it looks like it's Stars Drummer. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait to play Bad Guy Drummer. Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what that looks like, because that's kind of how she starts off. Like, uh-huh. you know, catch a catch a person dealing drugs on your station, space them. Like, yeah. <laughs> she's she's a fucking pirate, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to playing that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Me too. So yeah, uh, and then uh, we already talked about Philip. Uh, I think we're ready to to let people go. Of course, this will be the last time. This is the last episode we kind of record in the darkness, uh, in mm-hmm. the void. Uh, we will be back ne- uh, uh, in in just a couple of days uh, next week with a feedback episode that we're going to be considering feedback from episode three and four. Uh, send in email to beltaloda at baldmove.com if you'd like to be considered for that. Uh, and then we will be doing uh, the final two episodes pretty much in pace with you guys. Uh, we'll uh, have the episode out right as the episode drops around 7 p.m. Eastern midnight GMT on Thursday. Uh, and then we will have the the, uh, the the feedback episode out afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it'll be fun to you know, we finally caught back up with you and uh, we'll be burning hard towards the the penultimate and finale episode of the season. Yeah. Holy shit. The series. It's still, yeah. Yeah. We're we wouldn't even be halfway through a traditional season and yeah. we're two thirds. It's 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 crazy. So, uh, but yeah, we'll have discussion of that and the latest episodes from the the little uh, X-ray mini series. We'll be having discussion of that uh, on our feedback episode coming out this next Tuesday. Belt a load at dot com. If you'd like to get us your thoughts, uh, we will see you next week and consider them. Until then, I'm Aaron. And I'm Jim. Later. Later.